Hello and welcome back to the second of the lectures on forces and stresses, this time talking about surface stresses. We have one goal in the lecture and that is to present surface stresses and the common conventions for how we refer to surface stresses. So essentially this is explaining the letters that we use to refer to surface stresses and what they mean. Now a stress is similar to a force. It's a force per unit area transmitted through a material by interatomic force fields. So the only difference here between the force is that we're now considering the force per unit area, or force divided by area. Now a surface stress is like a surface force, um, except in the case that we talk about surface stresses, we're talking about a pair of equal and opposite forces acting on the area of a surface in a specific orientation. So what that means is we're talking about a balanced pair of forces acting on some surface. The units of stress are pascals, uh, here indicated as they usually are with a capital P and a lowercase a, and one pascal is simply one newton Per square meter. It's the force divided by area. The way that we represent stresses is the same way that we represent forces, except we have a pair of vectors now, so we still use vectors. And if you're going to indicate a surface stress, you would often also indicate the surface area um, and orientation that you're, you're referring to. So an example of surface stress and, and and something that you're familiar with would be if you push down on a table with your hands, you apply a force of the weight of your body, however much you're pushing down onto the table, and the table pushes back, and those two stresses balance one another. And the area that you're talking about in that case is the area of your hands touching the table. Now, just like we did with the forces, you could take components of stresses acting on some surface. And when you take the components, the common convention here is the component that is perpendicular to the surface. The component here shown in blue is referred to as the normal stress acting normal or perpendicular to the surface. And the shear stress indicated here in red is this, the component of the surface stress that's acting parallel to the surface itself. So those are indicated normally as sigma n for normal stress and sigma s for shear stress, this being the small Greek letter sigma. Now, let's take something we've already seen once and uh, do a, a little calculation. Here we're gonna calculate the surface stress of a column of rock. In this case, it's going to be the entire crustal column, 35 kilometers thick, and we're going to calculate that surface stress at the moho, at the base of the crust. So we'll assume an average thickness of 35 kilometers and a typical crustal density of 2,750 kilograms per cubic meter. The task for you is to determine how large the vertical surface stress is at the base of this column. And I'll give you a hint and say that you might want to report that value in megapascals. So think about what we did before when we calculated uh, the force of some column of rock. Remember now that we're doing the force divided by area to do stresses and see what you can come up with. Um, this would be a good time to pause the video and maybe do a little calculation. Okay, so Hopefully you've calculated something for sigma yy, the vertical stress acting on the base of this crustal column, and let's see how you've done. In order to do the calculation, we simply are going to say sigma yy is equal to rho gy. Previously, the force we had considered was rho gy delta a. That was an area. Now we're dividing by area so that delta a is gone and we're left with sigma yy equals rho, the density, times the acceleration due to gravity times the thickness y. So in this case, we have 2,750 kilograms per cubic meter. 
9.81 for the acceleration due to gravity and 3,000 or 35,000 rather meters for the thickness. And hopefully you came up with something like 944 megapascals. Just remember, we calculate this value here in pascals based on these standard units. And then if you divide that by a million, you should get something like 944. Okay, let's take a look at another example now. In this case, we'll consider a block of continental crust floating on the mantle. So a very idealized situation here. You could see a block of continental crust shown in the figure with some thickness H floating in the mantle um, as shown. The crust floats because it has a typical density of something like 2,750 kilograms per cubic meter, whereas the mantle is significantly more dense, about 3,300 kilograms per cubic meter. In other words, it has a lower density, so it's buoyant. If we assume hydrostatic equilibrium, then the weight of the crustal column of some thickness h is equal to that of the mantle at the depth of the base of the crustal column. In other words, the weight of this continental crustal block is equal to the equivalent weight of this thickness b of the mantle. In other words, rho c times h, the crustal density times h, its thickness, is equal to the mantle density times the thickness of that portion of the mantle. Okay, so with this in mind, now let's ask the question, how high does a 35 kilometer thick continent stick out above the mantle? mantle? So in this picture we have here, how high would that, con that top surface of the continental crust be relative to the surface of the mantle? Using the equation that you have here, you can calculate this. It might take you a little bit of thought. You can pause the video and, and see what you can come up with. Um, but I can tell you, you can use this hydrostatic equilibrium equation here. And let's see if you can't figure out how high that crustal piece sticks out above the surface of the mantle. All right. Hopefully, um, you've come up with something similar to what I have here. So the question was, how high does this continental crustal surface stick out above the mantle? Well, we know from our statement of equilibrium that we have this balance between the crustal density and its thickness and the mantle density and its thickness. We know three out of these four things. We know rho c, we know h, and we know rho m. So we can solve then for the value of b. So let's just divide this left side by rho m, or in other words, b equals rho c h divided by rho m. If you plug in the numbers there, you'll get something like 29.2 kilometers for the thickness of that mantelpiece. The elevation difference then would simply be h minus b, and in that case, you should come up with something like 5.8 kilometers. Okay, so what was the point of that calculation? Well, um, it was a very highly simplified scenario, but it does actually have some relevance to the Earth. If we look at the average elevation of the surface of the continents, it's about sea level. And the ocean basins on average are about four kilometers below that. Now, the continental lithosphere is not as low dense, or as, as low density rather, as continental crust. It's a little bit more dense. An oceanic lithosphere is maybe a little bit less dense than the mantle lithosphere. So the numbers aren't quite the same, but you can see how the continents would float about four kilometers above the ocean basins. And that's just based on simple um, isostatic equilibrium. Okay, so let's now get into the naming convention for these stresses and talk about horizontal surface stresses. Previously, we've been talking about these vertical surface stresses like sigma yy, the surface stress acting on the base of that crustal column we looked at earlier. The two horizontal surface stresses that would be paired with sigma yy are sigma xx and sigma zz, and those act normal or perpendicular to vertical planes in the Earth as shown in the diagram here. So we had been looking at forces acting normal to the y-axis, the vertical axis, now we're looking at forces acting perpendicular to 
the x and z axes. So combined, sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma zz are the three normal stresses. Those are the three stresses that are acting perpendicular to the three directions x, y, and z in our coordinate system. Now in rocks that are hot or weak, in which case they're flowing very easily, um, it might be the case that all three are equal to the weight of the overlying rock or what's called the lithostatic pressure here listed as PL. In that case, the lithostatic pressure is exactly defined as sigma xx, which is equal to sigma yy, which is equal to sigma zz. And as we know, we've calculated what sigma yy is. It's simply rho gy. So that is um, lithostatic pressure is something you'll come across um, elsewhere in the course. And actually, you'll come across it in scientific literature when you're talking about the Earth as well. Now, one thing just to note here quickly is that this orientation of x as horizontal, y as vertical, and z going in and out of the plane of the slides is the, the orientation that the coordinate system will use um, in the subsequent lectures, all the lectures that follow this one. In contrast to the normal surface stresses, we have the tangential surface stresses. And so we've seen already some examples of surface stresses that are acting normal and perpendicular to a surface. Well, of course, there are also shear stresses that act parallel or tangent to surfaces like in strike-slip faults. So these stresses, such as sigma xz, are called shear stresses. Sigma xz, you can see here, as this vector that's running parallel to the plane of the yz surface. So that is a shear stress that would be running parallel to that surface. The convention for labeling these stresses is that the first letter you give is the direction perpendicular to the surface, and the second letter is the direction that the force is acting in. So you can see then, for example, with sigma xz, that you're perpendicular to the x-axis, and the force or the stress is acting parallel to the z-axis. So it's acting in the z direction. Now, this is a little thought experiment because uh, why not? What is the orientation of sigma yx? Let's see if you can understand how these forces are drawn. And uh, if you want, you can draw a little picture kind of like what's shown on the slide and see if you can come up with the orientation of sigma yx. I'll give you a moment to pause the video. All right, hopefully you've come up with something that looks like this. I just added a little box on here on the, the top, highlighting an orange and additional surface. Sigma yx should be acting perpendicular to the surface that is running along the y-axis, so perpendicular to the y-axis on that surface and in the direction of the x-axis. So that's where sigma y-x should be oriented. All right, this lecture had a lot of terminology and um, I know it's a little bit tricky, but go ahead and take the quiz, see what you took in, and um, if I see any troubles, we'll talk about it in class when we get together. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next lecture.